Welcome, Susan Antlin, to Failed Haiku Interviews. And uh, Susan, if you're not aware, is uh, the, currently the editor of ACORN. Uh, she's been active in the Haiku Society of America for years. Uh, she has been active in the SoCal groups for years. And uh, she's been involved with Haiku herself, both publishing and editing. So uh, I wanted to bring somebody on who could uh, give, you a, give you a little bit of an understanding of, of where they're coming from, uh, not only how they create their own Haiku, but how they look at other people's. So, Susan, you have the floor. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do well, in the first, real world. Okay, well, thank you, Mike, for having me. This is uh, an honor. Um, first, I better correct one thing. It's I'm not active in the SoCal group. It, I'm oh. active in the Northern California group. Pardon me, I know that. SoCal and, I, and I North Cal. Too quickly. <laughs> very different. Um, so I live in Walnut Creek, uh, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, east of Oakland. But I'm originally from the east. I grew up in Rockville, Maryland. Mm. Um, and then I came out here and went to college at UC Santa Barbara and got a degree in English literature and then moved to Japan for three years, um, which obviously shaped my life quite a bit. Uh, I met my husband there. Um, we came back in 91 and went to law school. Uh, had our first child during our third year of law school. So my law career was sort of derailed at that point, but it kind of opened up possibilities for other things. So everything, you know, worked out great. Uh, currently, my paid work is for my husband's law firm. I don't practice law, but I do sort of everything other than practice law. Um, I call myself office manager, but I, I just do whatever needs to be done. Um, paying bills, getting bills out, that kind of thing. Um, and as you said, my the work that I love is editing Acorn. Uh, I'm active in the Haiku Poets of Northern California. Um, I'm their newsletter editor. I maintain their website. Um, and during the pandemic, I've been helping to run Zoom meetings for them. And it's been just tremendous. We've had people from all over. You know, we haven't been limited to just our immediate Bay Area poets. We've got people from uh, not just around the country, but we occasionally have people from other countries. So it's really been um, a great experience. Cool. Well, I'm real familiar with San Francisco area and Walnut Creek because my parents moved out there when they retired. And uh, my brother was at Berkeley for 10 years. And mm -hmm. my sister was at San Francisco State University. So. Oh. We got, we got a lot of people. So I've spent a lot of time out there and it's it's absolutely beautiful. I lived I lived in Southern California for a while near Malibu. So oh. I I love California, but now I'm in the I'm in the woods of Michigan. But uh, Acorn, you know this. And I think everybody who knows me knows it is one of my favorite journals. Hmm. Thank you. It is, it's right up there. It, the, uh, the two I always talk about are Mayfly and Acorn because they, uh, in fact, I had up until recently when I started giving away my library, I had every single issue and every supplement from Acorn. Oh, wow. Uh, tell us about how you got into that because that's it's sort of an interesting story about how Acorn developed and the different editors. Right. Well, it is interesting because, you know, I've never even met uh, Andrea Messias. Um, she created it. She launched it. She did an amazing job, obviously, um, and then handed it over to Carolyn. And I'm pretty sure she and Carolyn hadn't met in person when that happened. They later met. Um, and but Carolyn and I have been good friends. Um, when I first got into haiku, 
I quickly got on the internet and found the Haiku Poets in Northern California, and she's very active in that group. So she and I became friends. And in 2012, when she felt it was time for her to step away from Acorn, she just asked me if I was interested. And it was just a, a great time for me because I was just sort of thinking I could, you know, the kids were getting a little older, I had a little more time. And um, it's been wonderful. Yeah, for, for people who don't know, AC Messiah, when she started it, it, it was it was just a, a force of nature and it caught on with everybody and uh, with Jim Cation and everybody was talking about it. It was one of those things. And it took off. And it's just a very, if you haven't, if you don't subscribe, you really need to. Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful little zine. Now, when Carolyn took over, I, I I didn't I've met AC once for about five minutes and I've met Carolyn for probably less than five. I spent more time really? with you than any other editor of Acorn. <laughs> but I think the interesting thing, and I'd like you to talk tell me about it, is how does it feel the continuity with Acorn never let up? It's rare to have three editors and not see something change, but the quality of the work when you I had every issue. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Well, you know, obviously I'm extremely fortunate just to have this, you know, land in my lap already formed and have, you know, my inbox fills with names that, you know, make up the haiku world, really. It's it's an honor. Um, but I think we've each put our touch on it a little, you know. Um, I think that Acorn has always been known as a a journal of nature haiku primarily, mm -hmm. but uh, I've, uh, well, one thing I've tried to do is uh, make sure that it includes people from a wide geographic area. Well, it's probably partly just because the internet has really yeah. made that happen in recent years, but it's something that I especially love and um, I felt that in order to include as many people as I could, I would stop taking more than one poem per poet. So that's the one thing that did change with me. Um, and Carolyn actually said, oh, you know, it's too bad you're not taking more than one, but it, <laughs> and it's nice to have more than one yeah. if you can fit it, if you can fit it. But Acorn is really small. If it were to get any thicker, it would be prohibitive to mail it really you know it would, it would just be difficult financially so um we've, i've kept it small um i did make it slightly larger carolyn i think told me i could include 106 poems maximum don't dare go over that and i think my highest was about 114 or 115 so i try to squeeze as many as possible and i only take one per poet in order to be as inclusive as you know, possible. Um, That's what makes I, it I, cool. I, I yeah. actually <laughs> like that concept. That doesn't, and in print, you're stuck. I like I'm on the internet. I can if I can take all the poems you can send me that are, that work, I can I can publish them. But the beauty of Acorn is you slip it in your pocket, and you can <laughs> carry it around for you for two months, and you're in a waiting room or you're hanging out someplace. And uh, you just reach in there and it's just good poetry. So you've done a fine job. And I'm, I didn't mean to say nobody changed anything, but it's the, the thing is, the quality of it has stayed very high. And probably because you only take one. <laughs> how many submissions do you get? How, how many poets are submitting to you right now? Just curious. Um, I... I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I haven't tracked the numbers very carefully, but it does seem that it's increasing every time. I did note that this time, you know, the, the, this current reading period began on January 1st and it ends at the end of February. We do two reading periods per year. Um, on January 2nd, I had received over 100 haiku. 
I mean, not a hundred haiku, a hundred submissions. So a hundred <laughs> different poets sent me, you know, five to 10 to 15 haiku each by January 2nd. So when people get upset that I'm saying no to perfectly good poems, and I do, they are perfectly good quality haiku, but I can't take them all. So I really just have to make a judgment call and it's complicated. So I, I don't know that all readers understand that, but you know, I really try to go for a balance. I, I try to have some pure nature haiku, but some I want some urban images. I want uh, poems from young people. I want well-known uh, names as well, of course. But I and I love to have I love to have poets who have never been in Acorn. So I track everything. Whenever I get a submission, I put it into a database, and I can see right away that that person's never been in. And I, I lean a little more towards those people. You know, I, I'll, I'll I'll try if I can to take one of those because, you know, that can make a big difference. I think in a young poet's uh, progression to get a poem into a journal, to have their name side by side with somebody who is very well known. You know, I think that's a cool oh, that's thing. A big, and I, that's a, absolute. That's the biggest thrill of being an editor, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's some names I could name them. I know that they know, and I, I know that they're good, and I know that they crafted every poem. Uh, but uh, when, when you get surprised, a name comes up and it's just somebody you didn't know before. Yeah. And and then you find out, you accept the poem and they say, oh, this is my first or this is my first hyphen yes. or whatever. I, I get a kick yes. out of that. But that's, oh, it's a thrill. It, it's yeah. very gratifying to hear that back from a poet when they say this is my first publication. And um it's also extremely gratifying when you later see some of those poems go on and and be included in anthologies or get mentioned in an article. I, I feel sort of a maternal uh, joy, you know. It's it's like seeing your kid on the stage or something. You know, I'm I'm rooting for those haiku. I feel really a sense of pride and joy almost as if I'd written them but of course I didn't all I did was select them that's the other thing I tell people is that every single editor is a con artist we have con really good poets into sending us their best work it's like I'm getting a journal for free you know oh I know it's fantastic it's an honor it's yeah. a real honor to be able to read not just that one poem that everybody sees but to read all of the, the 10 or 15 that they sent. It's interesting. Yeah, and it's it, it also helps you because if you see somebody taking a risk or trying something different and you like it, you might try it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Certainly made me do a lot of crazy things. That, as, as some, some of them never left uh, my computer. <laughs> I, I, I've always enjoyed it. When you are, for your own work, uh, that you've written. Where can people find it on the internet? Are there places that they can go to see your work? Um, well, so I have a personal Twitter account, Susan Antolin. I used to put some of my work on there, but then politics kind of got in the way, but I'm hoping to go more back to that. I, ha I have a Twitter for Acorn. Uh -huh. um, where I usually just retweet things that I think are good quality. Um, or I might post a quote related to haiku or something. Um, so that's Twitter. I, there's a selection of my work on the um, Man Library Daily Haiku site at wow. Cornell. That actually is a great resource. If anyone's interested in just poking around, exploring, different, you, you can see all the names of the people who have been on the site. And um, then you can see a month's worth of their poems because it's it's curated by Tom Clausen. So right. he has selected the poets and he selects a month's worth and then posts one poem per day. So you can see 30 or so poems for all these different poets. So 
that's one place. And then I have an essay posted on the Modern Haiku website that um, I'd love people to go read. Uh, it's uh, on understatement in haiku. And so that kind of uh, contains a lot of sort of my philosophy and my what I appreciate in haiku. Uh, by the way, for, for your sake and for everyone else, right below this YouTube video will be the links to all of those things she's referenced. Great. But that's Great. the the internet is an interesting thing. I mean, uh, uh, Acorn has a site uh, of your mm -hmm. own, and it has examples on it also, which is really helpful for people. Yeah, every issue I choose about seven poems, and um, post them. They're not. It's not necessarily like these are the best poems of the issue, but I try to select poems that represent a variety of what you might find. You know, what does a good one-liner look like? Or, you know, different sort of tones. And so people who don't subscribe, they could get a pretty good idea of what Acorn is looking for. Yeah, and it's also, it's, it, it also gives you it, those kind of free sources and, and hints. I'm always surprised at people who submit and they don't seem to have read the journal itself <laughs> or looked at any <laughs> examples. And I'm thinking, yeah. you know, you didn't quite read the submission guidelines. But yeah. uh, uh, that will, that's, a, that's something that I've noticed is, is I go to those. And it's, it's like you say, it's not the best necessarily, although they're all good. If you, yeah. if you're, if you make it into Acorn, it's good. But <laughs> the, it's the ones that are interesting or will illustrate something. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're shooting for too? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. But, and here's, here's the other question that I always uh, ask people is how did you ever get into this? This is a weird genre that we're in and it, it not every, it doesn't appeal to some regular poets, but when you're in it, it's, it's charmingly addictive. You, you you almost exclude yourself from other things. How did you yeah. get there? How'd well, you so that's interesting. Every every haiku poet has a particular origin story. Um, mine is, uh, as I mentioned, I moved to Japan uh, after college, and I was teaching uh, English conversation mostly to businessmen in Tokyo. And a typical day would find me, you know, teaching at one company uh, in the morning for an hour or two. And then I might have one or two or three hours before my next class at a different company in a different part of Tokyo. And so instead of trying to run home to my apartment and sit for a few minutes and then go back out, I would have these weird blocks of time where I would just sort of browse around. I might sit in a coffee shop or very frequently browse a bookstore. So one day I was just browsing a bookstore and I picked up and I have it here, uh, Salad ah. Anniversary by Machi Tawara. Uh, and it's this translation, if anyone's interested, it's the Juliet Winters Carpenter yeah. translation. I think I probably gasped out loud right there when I started reading the poems. And of course, this is not haiku. This is tanka. Right. But it was my introduction to Japanese short form poetry. And, um, and they're actually, in this translation, they're in three lines. So they do appear very much like haiku. Um, but the content is very... Um, very contemporary, you know, really talking about human relationships and city life of a young woman. And it just really spoke to me. So I think that the key thing about that though, is that I came to haiku, not through Blythe, not through the old masters, not through any of that. I came through the other side, <laughs> you know, very contemporary, more urban kind of uh, material, which just really spoke to me. And still, I think I gravitate a bit 
towards, you know, that kind of thing. Although I do absolutely love nature haiku as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same way, obviously. Senator sort of captured me at some point, and I'm not sure. But I don't know a single haiku poet that doesn't write senru, and I don't know a single yeah. senru poet that doesn't write haiku. Once you've once you've figured out how the the format and and the way it's structured, it's it's real easy for you to transmit between the two, don't you think? Absolutely. But the interesting thing is that I've heard that in Japan, you really tend to either be a haiku poet or a senryu poet. It's not a back and forth kind of thing kind of curious you know it's, I don't know why that is but I I don't know that they know it, except that it was it was one of those it's one of those things where the, the haiku masters in Japan are a lot more hands-on than we are here uh, in the west in general yeah, that could be it's I don't I don't think you have that kind of thing like you know there's no Michael Dillon Welsh school, or uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, true. You know, he may have his own, <laughs> but uh, the I think that that's that's the thing. But the other thing is, we're not. I don't know. You get interested in your thoughts on it, but I I view it as haiku in the West is haiku in the West. I'm not Japanese, and I, I worked for a Japanese company for ten years. And I know them and love their culture and love the people, but uh, I'm I'm still a Yank. No, absolutely. It, it, haiku is just the the way we express ourselves, but we're writing about our lives in a very, I think, authentic way. Mm -hmm. um, you can see every now and then when you get a submission of somebody who has this idea that they're writing this Japanese art form and, and they try to write about you know kimono and this kind of thing and it you know that's not it it, it it's really it's uh it's uh we're writing about our lives right so i would say and, it's you know american haiku but uh, uh acorn is really international so right. it's uh, i was gonna say i always say west and east because uh, i would say uh, a third, anyway, of the poems that are, that wind up in American sort of American journals that originate here are from elsewhere, all over the world. Right. Failed haiku certainly is. It's probably half outside. Well, it's really flourishing in India, so I don't know if you can say West even. Yeah. You, know. okay. <laughs> you got me. Yeah. Certainly in India and Africa are hot, both right now they're they're Absolutely. really discovering haiku, and it's uh, that's gratifying too. But I think it's it just this is some, one of those things that you know when it captures your attention, for some reason, we you you click. I don't know if it's genetic, I, but, <laughs> but people that get into haiku just they get in it and they go they they just drop off. I was writing, yeah. you know, free verse and poetry and I was getting published, but uh, somehow these little poems got me. Yeah. But uh, when you, uh, who are the people that you, that once you latched on, who did you latch on to? Did, who did you learn from? Who were the mentors that you had? Well, so, um... When I started writing haiku, that wasn't until much later. So I, I picked up that book in Tokyo and just really carried it with me for a decade before <laughs> I even thought about writing any. I just loved reading it. Um, but it wasn't until the early 2000s that I really started wow. writing. And then I quickly found HPNC. And so those poets really became my teachers. Um, the first HPNC meeting I attended, I just happened to sit right next to Gary Gay. I didn't know who he was. And we did what we do at every meeting is we begin with a round and you say your name, where you live, and you read a haiku. And then we just go around. That's how we begin. And after we went around, uh, he turned to me and he said, oh, I really like that haiku you read. 
And so I'm like, oh, that's so nice. You know, and I went home later and looked him up. I was like, oh, that's Gary Gay. <laughs> and so, you know, I mentioned that partly because I think that's a really important thing to remember to, to take a moment and tell a new poet that you appreciate their work. Absolutely. It makes such a difference. Um, I've tried to always keep that in, in my mind. Um, another poet who did that was uh, Tom Tico. Uh -huh. He's a, really a legendary uh, haiku poet True. in the Bay Area. And um, I only met him once, but uh, early on when I published my first poem in Modern Haiku, he sent me a postcard in the mail saying how much he liked it. I was shocked, you know, it's just sort of like you send your work out and you don't really know that people are reading it and appreciating it. So for someone to take the time to actually write a postcard, that really meant a lot. So I've always kept that in mind, you know, that mm -hmm. that's such a nice and important thing to do. Um, but also other poets who have really helped me grow as a poet are um, Carolyn Hall mm -hmm. and uh, Faye Aoyagi. Uh, the two, the three of us have gotten together in person regularly and over the years. And uh, it's important to have a group of people who will be very honest with you. Uh, I can always count on Carolyn and Faye to, to honestly say, you know, <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's no good. Oh. Or, you know, you know, Two of the lines show promise, but you know, you really need to find a third line there. That one's not working. So things like that and, and, and working together to see how we can make a poem work better, why it's not working or you know, what they do like about another one. I've learned so much from that kind of um, interaction. Uh, another poet who I used to carpool with, I would drive him to HPNC meetings was Jerry Ball. Uh, when he moved to Walnut Creek, actually, uh, from Southern California, yeah. I would drive him to the meetings in San Francisco. And those drives became my haiku learning. You know, he was, he had been wow. in, into haiku for way, way longer than I have. So, um, you know, those kind of opportunities are really incredibly valuable. Yeah, I could name you some. Uh, Francine Perrin was one of mine. She was so nice to me in the beginning. And Anita Virgil, who just passed away, mm -hmm. another one. But I, I will pay you this compliment, Susan. You're one of the nicest people to get a turn down from. <laughs> you really are. You're, you ha you're always positive. And, it, 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 and it, yeah, I know it sounds like a crazy thing. But I can appreciate when you accept one. I can appreciate when you don't. Oh, and that's that's something you. that's something that editors don't all have. Some of them can be so brusque, you know. Uh, and and you well, really saying have no it. is thank you. Saying no is it's not fun. You know, <laughs> I wish I could say yes to everything. So I try to do it, you know, as nicely as I can. But some people don't take it that way. Some people get pretty upset. Yeah, occasionally I've, I've managed to get everybody back who's threatened to, I'm never going to submit again. Well, I've published you a half a dozen times. It's not like this is the first time I say, mm, and you go, I'm running away. Don't do that. You know, I, I get, I don't know about you, but I have been, I've had a thousand poems that didn't make it into publication yeah. it's okay absolutely you know what sometimes I actually feel grateful later yeah. I might initially say oh I didn't get in this time oh that's that's kind of a bummer and then a month or two later I'll say oh that's actually good those <laughs> I'm kind of glad those aren't out there you know <laughs> yeah and and that, that's the, the other thing that surprises you too is which ones an editor chooses because they they'll choose one and, and that was your the the one you wanted to get to 10 so you just pulled one off the list and threw it at the bottom oh, yeah. that's the one that gets published yeah. and you go wow and what it forces you to do is is just what you just said is look back at at your work and say, your own so self-critically and say you know those weren't my best poems. <laughs> 
<laughs> I let it Susan down there. <laughs> so that's that's one of the joys of being an editor is that you have to you have to sort of suck it up, and you're also critical of yourself. You know that's good. But and the other thing I'll point out, and I want to want you to comment is having a group of people to work with. Uh, and Gary Gay, I can't think of a nice person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you're going to get your first compliment on IQ, that'd be the one I'd want. And, uh, you know, uh, Carolyn Hall, uh, you've got some great people out there. And uh, you were part of, you came and presented to Michelle Ruth Bernstein's Evergreen mm -hmm. Haiku. Mm -hmm. She's my teacher. You, you never yeah, not she's have wonderful. A, never not have a group of people that yeah. you can work with. Yeah. And you you hit that. That's important to you. Are there any other groups or particularly affected you? Well, mostly HPNC. I have you know on the side gotten together with with people um, over the years, um, and I was in a writing group that was not poetry at all. It was just a, a general women's writing group that was incredibly meaningful to me. I was in that for about a decade, but you know. Uh, my son is an artist and so a, a, a painter, but we often talk about art. And I think that, that haiku is very much like other art that it really flourishes when people get together. You know, uh, it's rare, I think, for a painter or a poet to just develop in complete solitude off on their own. You know, the, the, the impressionists in France, they were, feeding off each other, right? They were inspiring each other. Um, and they were I think all staying at Gertrude Stein's. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's why you see clusters, like haiku is taking off in India, is taking off in Ghana, is taking off in uh, Croatia. It's not evenly spread all over the world. It's in these clusters. And I think it's because Poets are getting together, they're inspiring each other, they're holding each other accountable in a way. You know, if you're gonna go to a meeting, you have to have something to share. That right there is gonna make you a better poet because you have to you have to write something that you feel comfortable sharing with these other human beings. So you're gonna write a little better than you would if you're just sitting there on your own uh, without anybody to interact with. Yeah, and I think that's the whole purpose of poetry. You're sharing a piece of yourself. And there's two values to that. One is, even if it never gets published, it's yours. And you, you, you keep it. It's like any memory that you have. It, you put it down, it's, it's like a journal. And the other thing is, is sharing it with other people. And that's what, if you look, go back to the roots of uh, what haiku is today, Basho was all about sharing. That was his thing. He was he was sitting in a group. He had people. He he went from home to home. It was it's interesting. He, it's like he took his own haiku groups all over the the North Country. Yeah, and that's that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> what what parts of the haiku experience do you participate in? I mean, there's haiga, there's senru, there's haibin. What parts are the most interesting to you and that you dabbled in? I've dabbled in all of them except not Haiga. Yeah. I don't really consider myself a visual artist and you know I enjoy it, but I haven't really produced my own. But I love Haibun and yeah. obviously Haiku, Senyu, Tanka, um, all of those. And, and how did you, uh, uh, when, when you fell into to, to Haiku, how did you find out about the other other corners of Haikai and what's involved. What was what was the process there? Was that through the the, the group? Um, I think you know I really started to get into it seriously in the early two thousands, and you know by then we had the internet. And I say that because when I first learned about uh, you know Machi Tawara's book. There was no internet, so <laughs> things were you know different. Uh, but by the early 2000s, I could just get online and just start exploring. And so it was pretty easy, really, just to start uh, subscribing to magazines. I quickly 
started subscribing to Frog Pond and Modern Haiku and whatever else I could find. And um, yeah, how about, so how about groups like I know that you presented at HNA, so mm -hmm. you're you're familiar with them, right, too? Yeah, so I think it was in around 2009 when it was in Ottawa. Uh, Carolyn and Faye said, oh, you should come, because I had never been to one before. They said, come, we're going to have a great time. And so uh, I was a little hesitant because I was leaving young kids behind and, you know, it felt so self-indulgent. I, you know, I'm a stay-at-home mom. Can I really afford to go off and have this uh, time at a conference? Well, I had so much fun. I loved every minute of that conference and I kept meeting people and I would look at their name tag and say, oh, you know, I, I know who you are, you know, so it was just wonderful. So when I came back from that, I said to the family, this, I'm going to do this every two years. Mm -hmm. This is something I need. So I haven't missed one since then. Hmm. You missed the, were you at the Queen Mary? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was that was there. a fun one. Yeah. Uh, that was I, great. The location was just totally crazy, and I couldn't believe the ballrooms inside of a boat, but yeah, I never quite great. had that experience before, but it was yeah. excellent. Now, I, I think that uh, HNA is one of the things, and I mentioned it because Gary Gay and Michael Dillon Welsh and others have done a lot of work on that and uh, uh, to keep it alive, and that's one of those places where you can find out about every aspect of haiku. Yeah. Um, where do you publish your work? Uh, and and how, how do you choose who to send your poems to? Curious. Well, I'm not really that good about uh, regularly sending out my work like I should. I get busy with other things. I, I mean, I'm always actively writing that's my, my main focus is just to keep writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I always send to Mariposa, that's the HPNC membership journal, because, you know, I'm active in HPNC. I was an editor of Mariposa for several years also. Um, and actually, that's how I learned about editing was because I was a co-editor with Ebba Story. She oh. came ill for a while and needed someone to step in and help. And so I did one issue by myself and then she and I ended up doing it together in person. We would, she would come to my house and we would have a marathon editing session, like eight hours or something. And I just learned and learned from her. She was just an amazing teacher about the editing process. Um, so yeah, I always send to Mariposa and then it just depends if I have time or if somebody says, Oh, there's a new journal like I sent to um, Kingfisher. Yeah. I have that here. I should give a little plug for that. That's a another great place to send work, Tanya McDonald. Um, and you know, occasionally Modern Haiku or Frog Pond or um, yeah. Yeah, the, the usuals. <laughs> the usuals, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the usual suspects, but we yeah. all have them. But uh, that's a King Picture. I'll make the plug with you. That's an excellent, excellent journal. And mm -hmm. it, it sort of almost a, uh, it has the same concept as an acorn. Keep it small, keep it, keep it compact, and, uh, and it's very selective and excellent poems. I mean, she does an excellent job. So I'm with you on that one. Do you have any books? Do you, have you published yeah. books of your own. I know you have, but here's your chance to have the commercial. So <laughs> uh, my first book, I actually, I self-published um, Artichoke Season. And, um, and that was a good experience actually self-publishing. I really had full control and I like how it came out and I had a friend who was an artist and did the artwork. And so that was good. And then more recently, I had this, uh, The Year Sent Went Missing, was published by Backbone Press. Mm. Um, they had, that's Crystal Simone Smith in North Carolina. She had a, um, a haiku chapbook contest. It was the first one. She just decided to 
do that and see what happened. And so I won first place and got my book published. Fantastic. We'll put links oh, cool. to those uh, up, up below the YouTube and on the site. But uh, you, you mentioned those two. Do those books have a theme? Are they general? How did you approach them? Yeah, so I tend, as you probably know, to write very autobiographical stuff. Uh, and so Artichoke Season is really about um, raising young kids, mm -hmm. um, mostly. And um, the years that went missing is really about the time of life after the kids are little, when I was then sort of sandwiched in between still taking care of older kids, but then my mom became quite sick. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, so a lot of the poems are about that. I often joke that I hope in my next book, there'll be no mentions whatsoever of hospitals <laughs> or <laughs> any kind of illness, because there's a lot of that in, in that book, unfortunately. Well, yeah, but you know, those are those are experiences you go through. I, I went through that with my mom. She lived to be 96. And mm -hmm. but her, the last few years were pretty tough. And uh, you know, that's that those are the experiences you have. They're just as real as as any other. And they're just as as interesting as my mom had dementia. I don't know what your experience is, but my experience was I was I got to remember my mom mm. because I went back in order to counter her lack of memory. I was, I was forced to remember it. Wonderful time for me. I'm not sure for her, but the, it was an interesting moment. So I managed, I don't know whether I was just making the best of it or not, but my mom was one of those incredible people. She, she was a writer. She, she was smart. She was, the driving force in our family, but never in a bad way. My mom, I never felt discouraged by her. So what was your experience with your mom? I'm curious. Just, I, I know I've heard some of this myself. I'm drawing it out of you because you've, ha you've well, had it before. She's still alive. And in fact, she's living with us because yeah. when the pandemic hit, she was in an assisted living facility and I just made a very rash split second decision in early March, I said, you know, I don't feel good about this. So I'm pulling you out of there. So she's been living here with us. And um, yeah, it's been challenging. Uh, she had a very sudden and very severe uh, health crisis in 2011. Mm -hmm. And it was a physical thing. Uh, but it manifested as a psychological breakdown. You know, she had a mini stroke. She had white matter disease in her brain. She had various things, but she had a psychotic break. And it was over Mother's Day weekend in 2011 that she was in a, a psych ward on a, it's called a 5150 hold. She, I couldn't get her out of there. I mean, she she thought Al Qaeda was after her. She was completely in another world. And so I had never experienced anything even remotely like that. I, I was just devastated. And so a lot of uh, the haiku I wrote at that per time period were about that and in reaction to that. Um, and it really helped me, you know, haiku writing can be very therapeutic even if you don't get a particular poem published or anything, there's a lot of good that comes from just capturing your experience in a few words. It, it really does, it helps. And that found the same thing is it's no different than uh, your, your life is your life. And, and, and you write about the things you experience. So for good or ill, You've had, you've experienced it, and so that goes into the journal just as a as a haiku, and it's just a note for you. And a lot of them, uh, I forget who said it. I don't want to credit the wrong person, but it's like uh, it's a note to yourself mm -hmm. to to not forget that moment. Is that sort of? Mm -hmm. Am I hitting it? Definitely, and you know that's the thing. I I 
um, I always like to encourage people to write for yourself first. You know, write the poems that you really need to write. Write the poems that you are going to feel good about going back and rereading. You know, if you pick up your notebook of haiku from 10 years ago, you should feel good about that. Like it, it should trigger things and, and just give you a nice sense of satisfaction that you've created art out of um, moments of your life. That I think is more important, or at least to me anyway, it's more important to have that than to have my haiku in, in a particular journal or win a particular contest, right? Exactly. You know, I, I wanna have poems that I read later and say oh yeah I feel good about that you know yeah and that's that's the thing if a publication is is overrated as part of the creative process because uh, I have no idea how many poems Robert Frost actually wrote that never got published <laughs> you yeah. know it's it doesn't it doesn't matter it's the same it's the same thing and haiku is particularly good because those 17 syllables and the poem I usually use as an example Susan is Kiori wrote a poem about his about fireflies it's a perfectly beautiful pure haiku absolutely no people in it and when you read it's in Miyamori when you read uh why hit what he why he wrote it he, he as a journal he wrote it when he was holding the hand of his 12 year old sister when she died and I went, oh, I mean, but when the reader reads it, they read one thing. When you read it, it has a whole different meaning. So anyway, I think that's absolutely cool. Are you working on anything now? Are there projects that you're working on with your own work or in anthologies or anything else you'd like to tell us about? Um i'm i'm helping with the production you know a lot of uh work that i end up doing is not necessarily creative but it's just getting somebody has to do the production work you know like uh getting things to the printer and getting things set so i'm helping with um the two autumns anthology that's uh going to come out this summer uh, hpnc does a big reading once every year it's called the two autumns reading and there's a chat book that comes with that. So this year it's edited by Sharon Preddy, who is a oh. wonderful poet in San Francisco. And I'm helping do the production side of that. So that's a that's something that's on my list. Um, I've agreed to judge a couple of contests. And so that's that always takes time. I don't know if people appreciate that. It takes time to write the comments, you know. Um, but I enjoy doing that. And um, what else? I think that's it. Yeah, I, I, contests are fun. The, the one that blew me away, uh, Aubrey Cox and I judged the Virgilio contest one year for young kids. Mm -hmm. 3,000 entries. <laughs> wow. I was like, I'd never seen anything like that before. It, and we had a ball. Uh, and so, uh, and Aubrey's one of my favorite people. So, mm -hmm. but uh, that's those kind of things. The mechanics of it, people never think about. How do you get Acorn to show up? It's yeah. not that simple. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. It's time consuming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. formatting got to be the worst yeah. thing in the world. Yeah, and uh, that's. I, but you've done a lot of things and I, you're you're not i'm sure i could beef up your list if i wanted to but uh what do you want people to take away from this interview what do you want them to take away about about you acorn your work um well uh i guess i'd like them to take away that i i'm i'm rooting for you <laughs> you know if you send work to acorn i I want to accept it. If I don't, it's not because it's not good. Um, and advice, I'd like to give advice just to any, you know, new people new to haiku. Um, one, like we already said, is join a group. 
I mean, really, these days you can join a group even just virtually. Right. You can get on Zoom and meet with people. And I, I just think there's so much benefit to that. Um, and also uh, try to write something every day. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a finished haiku or even a perfect fragment of a haiku, but be observant and just get into that practice of paying attention. Uh, I just had a really nice email exchange the past few days with a young poet in North Carolina, Gideon Young, you may know him. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I've been writing every single day. And he said he, as he uh, got into the practice, he realized, you know, it didn't have to be a perfect uh, complete haiku every time, but just if he kept doing it and kept doing it, good ones would come and they have. And I noticed it in his work and I don't think he'll mind me sharing that, you know, but that's a really great uh, practice to get into. I took a series of uh, poetry lectures. It was a class that you could sign up for um, during the pandemic. I've done it twice now, um, classes with Ellen Bass, She's a, a well-known poet, not related to haiku, but she shared advice just for poets in general. Just uh, sit down and write 10 observations uh -huh. every day. Just, you know, let go of the need to make it perfect or poetic or anything. It's just a way to practice paying attention and I find that extremely useful. If I don't really have an idea for a haiku, but I feel like uh, writing, I will often start by just listing things, sensory observations. What do I hear? What do I see? Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be in that exact moment, but what have I seen today? What, what did I hear when I was on a walk? What did it feel like? You know, those can be great, great starting points for authentic haiku. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a big Busan challenge person, but so I write 10 a day every day. You do? And, and yes. So, wow. Yes. But, but there, but, but out of a hundred of them, there might be one. <laughs> well, still. It's that yeah. you would see. <laughs> and then you won't pick you'll pick one of the 10. And, and when you get down to it, that's what people need to understand. It's for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's one of the greatest, it's a, it's a tension reliever. It's a great thing. Even if you're writing about something that's happened, that's negative in your life, it's a wonderful thing. And, it, and because they're so short, they're just, I don't know, there's something about it, it triggers a whole lot more back in here. So I've, I've always, I've really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, uh, I've I've enjoyed your work. And uh, Acorn you. is one of my favorites. And between AC and Carolyn and you, you got a legacy there that's really phenomenal. And uh, I encourage people to all the time, not not just because I'm talking to you, to read Acorn and Mayfly and these small little journals that that you can, that have high quality. And uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time today and thank you very much, bottom of my heart. Thank you, thank you, it's an honor. Now we're the ones that are honored. Anybody that's listening <laughs> to this is listening to somebody who really, really cares. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you, Mike. Take care.